ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to Footprints. Uh, my name is Mr. Davis. Uh, I'm an educator here at BHS, and today I'm with one of my students from my leadership class. And this is Jackson Oliver. What's up, Mr. Oliver? How you doing? Good. So um, today we're really just going to talk a little bit about um, footprints and what type of footprint was left on me uh, and maybe what type of footprint might be left on you, the audience, or also what type of footprint was maybe left on Mr. Oliver. Um, so Mr. Oliver, do you have any questions for me that you might want me to answer in this particular thing? What inspired you to start uh, your, your career in education? So when I was a kid, education was very big in my house. Uh, I can tell you for a fact that my dad uh, really stressed education for all of us. Um, you know, I went to school and I would come home from school and my father would say to me, um, you know, I know you've been in school all day, but uh, I want you to uh, use fossil in a sentence. That's today's word. And I'm like, oh, come on, dad. And at the moment, at that time, I, you know, as a kid, you don't really see the value in that. Um, but as I got older, it was it really kind of served me well and helped me, and I saw the value in, in doing that. So that is one of my reasons why getting into education uh, was important for me. Not only that, I just I just loved to study. I was the type of kid that uh, I would go to school sick, and my siblings hated that, right? Because that meant now that they had to go to school too. So I was always into that, uh, and I I enjoyed school so much, uh, and still do. Uh what was the reason why you started uh, teaching the leadership class in place of ROTC? Interesting question. Um, so myself and Mr. Thomas got together. It's kind of a brainchild of both of ours. Uh, we started talking a little bit about what could actually this class be. And he gave me a book and a workbook um, by a guy named Sean Coveney uh, called Seven Habits of Highly Effective Teens. And obviously habits are something that you guys do every day. It's like you get up. In the morning, you go to the bathroom, you brush your teeth, you do your hair. Those are the habits you have every day, right? Make your bed, whatever you do, right? So I was thinking, wow, this will be great to teach because now I can kind of expose kids to something other than, hey, you know, this is history, this is English, this is math. You know, this is something that they can actually latch onto because it's something they do every day so they can relate to it. Uh, so that's kind of how it came about was like the brainchild of myself and Mr. Thomas. Pretty happy about it. Can you share a pivotal moment or experience uh, that shaped your journey? I can. Thank you for asking that question. That's um, very relevant. So when I was a kid, segregation was huge. Um, so people saw me, uh, you know, as different from them. Obviously, the color of my skin was a huge, huge deal to a lot of people. Um, but that's not the only thing that was relevant at that time. Um, you know, separate but equal was supposed to be a thing, but it never was. Um, and I was always a smart student, and my parents saw the value in me doing that and going to school. So being able to figure out exactly what I wanted to do at that time when I was young was important. But being able to follow the rules was also important. Um, I think for me, uh, facing adversity was kind of maintaining my control over everything, right? Because sometimes it's hard to maintain control when you're, you know, when everybody else is out of control. So for me, it was, it was maintaining that. So I'm going to tell you a quick story. So my parents um, were funny because I was always getting into fights. It was always scrapes. It was always something going on, right? Um, and one day my mom said to my dad, what are we going to do with this guy? What are we going to do with him? You know, what are we going to do with this kid? We, he's, he's getting in fights every day, and he's coming home, and we're getting called from work, and what are we going to do? And my dad didn't miss a beat. He said, we're going to put him in karate. And my mother goes, are you crazy? He's going to kill somebody. And my dad goes, that's the point. He knows that he can, and he'll figure out another way. So my, and it's funny how that really calmed me down and gave me discipline and focus, and my parents were always about giving me options. So that was really huge, um, and I thank them for that uh, a lot. What challenges have you faced in pursuing your goals, and how have they influenced your success? 
Well, as a, a young man, of course, you, you think you have plenty of time to do things, right? And I always say in the leadership class, we have the same 24 hours in the day. It's just what do we do with them? So for me, the challenge was to be relevant as a human being, first off, and then secondly, leave an imprint or a footprint on somebody else and encourage somebody else. So I've been a basketball coach for 25 plus years. I worked for the Boston Celtics for 15 of those years and during the summertime. And one of my mentors was Joe Amasino. And so I took from Joe being able to help people through basketball, because what's interesting about sports it's colorblind. Like, sports is completely colorblind. You don't care if the guy is pink, blue, brown, whatever he is next to you. You just want to know if he can play, right? And so that's one of the reasons why the Jackie Robinson story was huge, because he broke the color barrier at that particular time, right, in the 40s. And that's, that's, what, that's what sports was about. And so carrying that forward, that kind of that thinking, that, that Jackie Robinson thinking, I always had that in me. Uh, and I always wanted to kind of use that in an educational purpose. Um, so that was one of the reasons why um, I, it, it kind of drove me to this, to where I am now. Can you share a story or can you share a story about a person that profoundly impacted your life? Yes, I can. Um, so I talked a little bit about, a little bit about Joe Amasino, about the Celtics. And one thing that Joe was big on was uh, as my mentor, he wanted me to figure out what my purpose is. Because one day at lunch, he said to me, Tony, what, what's your purpose? Why, why do you coach? What's, what, what's the reason you do it? Some people do it for wins and losses. I do it because I want to see the kids get better. Uh, and I was able to find an AAU organization where we have like-mindedness, where we're thinking the same, where we just want to make sure kids get better with what they're doing. Um, and as they progress and get better, you see that as a coach. And you're like, you know what? I had a hand in that. And I feel proud to, to be his coach. And I'm glad that he decided or she decided to put in the work to get to that level. So Joe was always big on making me think forward, not think backwards. Uh, I, I related a story one time about my dad who, when I first got my license, uh, he's, we sat in the car, he's sitting next to me, he said, look in the rear view mirror. And I said, okay. He goes, see the rear view mirror? And he goes, you can peek at it sometimes and look back. He goes, but the most important stuff is in front of you. You need to be driving forward and looking forward. So I always try to do that. I always try to put one foot in front of the other and, and go forward with whatever it is I'm doing, no matter if it's good, bad, or indifferent. That's what I try to do. And uh, I've been pretty happy being able to do that. Can you share a time when you felt the impacts of your actions on your like, community or peers? I can actually share a time where I felt an impact on the community, and it's a basketball-related one. So um, there's a kid in college right now. He goes to WPI, and he played uh, travel basketball for quite a bit. And they didn't have a lot of success with the coach previous to us. So my son and I took over the team, the eighth-grade team, because they won in three years from – fifth grade to eighth grade, they won like three games. But the guy was a screamer, and he was always yelling and all that stuff and turned into a demon. You know what I mean? He's yelling at parents, kids, coaches, you know, his wife in the stands. You know what I mean? That kind of coach. So anyway, um, I took over this, this eighth grade basketball team. And what's interesting is I remember the first practice. The kids are practicing, and a lot of kids wouldn't take shots. We're like, shoot the ball. You're open. And they're like, well, coach, last year we, we, we weren't allowed to do that. And I said, listen, it's not last year, right? So I said, everybody's allowed to take a good shot within reason. So what happened is we won 13 games that season. My son and I coached that team. And people came up to me and said, oh, you're a great coach. You're a good coach. It wasn't that. It's the fact that we changed the culture of the team. And how do we do that? We empowered the kids but to make mistakes, to, to, to don't worry about it. It's always about the next play. It's always about the next possession. It's not about what you just did because life's not like a movie. You can't rewind it and get it back. So once we did that, all bets were off, right? Now they, they bought in. They were able to make mistakes and have fun playing through those mistakes. 
And that's what empowered that team to win 13 games. And it's now some of those kids are, are playing in college, and I'm, I'm very happy about that. That was uh, gloss to eighth grade travel, boys. What advice would you give to others who aspire to make a positive difference? Wow. I would say, first off, find your why, right? Um, so Steve Jobs was very inspirational to me because here's a guy who didn't graduate from college, and his commencement speech in 2005 at the University of Stanford was um, amazing, Stanford University. Um, so you got to find your why. Why do you get up every morning to do what you do? My parents said to me years ago, and I'll never forget this. My dad said, people get up every day. They go to jobs they hate. They have to go to this job. They're, they're working and, oh, I hate this. I got to go and deal with this boss this day. I hate it. He said, you want to find something you get to do. So there's a difference between have to and get to. And I get to do this. I get to come to school here. And I get to speak to students. And I get to hopefully influence students the right way. And I get to do that. And to me, that's important. It was funny. Steve Jobs shared this quote. He said, um, you know, someday, you know, you'll, you're thinking you, you may pass away. And inevitably, you may be right. That could be the last day of your life. What would you want to do on the last day of your life? And he goes, if you get up in the morning and you answer, the answer is yes, I'm going to do this the last day of my life, then that's something you really love and, and are passionate about. And that's me with teaching and educating and, and, and speaking with young folks and helping them get over the, the hurdles and, and adversity they might have in their life. So, yeah, absolutely, that's, that's what I'm about. What pivotal moment has left a footprint in your, uh, on your journey? Oh. Man, I, I, I've got so many to choose from. I can tell you, um, having been a basketball player and then a basketball coach, I see both sides and I see the value in both. So when I was young, I played at Weymouth South High School. Uh, I scored 1,527 points my high school career, no three-point line. For all you who out there, I, I would have scored over 2,000 easy. I got recruited by UNH. I uh, didn't go there. I went to Emerson um, and finished up, uh, you know, my education elsewhere. But what's interesting about that is all through that journey, I made this basketball team called the uh, Bay State Bombardiers. It was a CBA basketball team that played out of Northeastern. So my older brother dated a girl named Teresa. She went to Northeastern. She was on the radio station WRBB in Northeastern. I was on the radio station WERS 88.9 at Emerson. Anyway, he played pickup basketball one day and he saw a sign in there and he grabbed it, brought it home. and said, Tony, you can make this team. And I was thinking to myself, what? He's like, you're, you're one of the best basketball players I've seen. You're one of the best shooters I've ever seen. He goes, you can make this team. And I started thinking. And he put that in my mind. I'm like, no, well, maybe I can make this team. So guess what? I went to the trial. Now, when I get there, the trial's all, all week. It's Monday through Friday. 200 guys in the gym. Guys are athletic, dunking, all this stuff. I'm like, wow. So what I do, I just started doing my, my warm-up near the basket, and I go further and further out, and I start shooting, and I'm making shots. Nobody was doing that back when I was, was playing. Shooting from distance was not, it wasn't great. It was frowned upon. But anyway, I was really good at it, so I kept doing it. So, uh, long story short, all week long, I'm, I'm there at the trial, and the coach said the same thing. He goes, if your name is above the line, I'll see you tomorrow. If your name is below the line, better luck next year. So all week, my name was above the line. So now it's, it's Friday, last day of trials, and he goes, <clears throat> this is it. We have tw that's 25 guys there for 15 spots. And I'm thinking, uh-oh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to make this team, right? But my brother comes in with his girlfriend and says, listen, Tony, just do what you do. That's all he had to say. That's it. It was on. Had a great trial. Made this team called the Bay State Bombardiers. Played out of Northeastern University. Played semi-pro basketball with a bunch of guys. Lionel Hollins, old school, who used to be the head basketball coach at uh, Memphis Grizzlies. Played with a guy named World Be Free 
who played for the Philadelphia 76ers. Um, and it's interesting, just my journey being in basketball has taken me a lot of places, uh, and I've met a lot of people, and I'm very grateful for that journey and very grateful for those people and very grateful for that little round basketball that I fell in love with years ago. Looking back on your life, what do you hope that your footprint will be remembered for? So I always want to be somebody that's a relevant person, um, and I want to be somebody remembered for, like, you know what? He was a pretty good dude, you know? So I want to be remembered for that. Now, having said that, I do have seven children. Um, Caitlin's my oldest. She's 38. Jeanette's 35. Adrian's 31. Cameron, who just got engaged this past year, is 29. Um, Austin is 28. Um, Carrington is 24. And my youngest son, Ashton, is 18. He graduated from Gloucester High School last year. So my footprint to them is hopefully carrying on a legacy of being kind, because you never know what someone's going through, right? Uh, do unto others or you have others do unto you, right? Leaving that that legacy, making sure they understand that it's important to, to not only be f kind and friendly to someone who doesn't look like you, but to also be kind and friendly to everybody because you just never know what that person is going through. So to, to me, that's the lasting legacy I would like to leave not only as a person, but as an educator. Like someone will say to me, oh, you know what? You, I, I loved your class and I'm glad I, I took it. Um, those are things that make me happy and proud uh, to be part of the uh, BHS community. Can you share a uh, significant moment or experience that made you realize the impact of your footprint on others? Oh man, I can. Um, so it's funny that y you know we're asking these questions because these questions are very relevant. And my biggest thing is always to do unto others as you have others do unto you. So one of my friends I met from the uh, basketball clinics, the Celtics basketball clinics, is Mike Lamy. And Mike and I played high school basketball against each other and didn't even know it until we became friends at that clinic. So um, what's interesting about that is Mike has gone through a lot of things, and he's also a, a tremendous triathlete, by the way. Um, but we're different but the same. And I think that goes for everybody in the world. Like, everybody wants to be happy. Everybody wants to have a good career. Everybody wants to have a good family. Hopefully they're, they're healthy and happy, right? But the most important thing you want to do is you want to be remembered as someone who did something for someone else, right? Empathetic, right? Maybe you said something or inspired that person to do something, right? Which is why we're having this, this Footprints podcast because the footprints that were embedded on me I would like to give back to the community and those folks who who really kind of need it um, So that's really where it's at for me is to be able to leave my footprint not only as a, a, a great relevant person But a great relevant educator that that was really kind of cool What pivotal moments and decisions have left a Everlasting footprint on your life and journey so one of the biggest things that I have is stay away from negative people. They, they have a solution for every problem. So if you think about that, and it sounds funny, but it is true. Because a lot of times my dad would say, oh, don't, don't concern yourself with them. He goes, that, that's the fellowship of the miserable. Those are people that want to drag you down. And he goes, kind of avoid those people at all costs. One of the biggest things my dad said to me when I was a kid, and I remember this, distinctly is sometimes a man or a woman will meet their destiny on the road they took to avoid it. So what's interesting about that is I was 13. I was like, what? What, what, what does that mean? But as I went on with my life and I saw how things unfolded, unfolded, excuse me, um, it was like, wow, I can't believe he said that to me. Like, for instance, you could be on a road and you see a problem coming down that road. You're like, oh, that's an issue right there. I don't, I don't think I really want to continue on this road. And you get off that road and you get on another one. Guess what's on that road that you just got off of? The, the same issue, the same problem. So what you want to do is you want to deal with it, right? And you deal with it in your own way. 
however you can. Maybe someone can help you through it. Maybe you can focus and do it yourself. Um, but once you get through it, now you say to yourself, you know what? That wasn't so bad. That wasn't that bad. I could have, I, I, I dealt with that. I could have gone through that okay. And you did. You come out the other side. And it's called life experience. And then once you get that, now you're able to recognize certain situations in life, right, that come up, that prop up. And you're like, all right, all right, I see that's going to happen. But now I've, I've seen that before. Now I know how to deal with it. And so I'm that type of person that if I can help you in any way, I want to be able to, to help you through those rough patches in your life. Kind of like um, Steve Harvey. I love Steve Harvey, the guy from Family Feud, right? So one of the things that, that he did, uh, he made this five-minute video, which is very impactful, about being a leader. Um, and one thing he said in that was, and there's a couple things he said in that, but one thing he said in that was he was doing a radio show back in 2005, and he inspired a guy that was in prison to become uh, a chef or a cook in a, in a hotel. He said, you know, you can make a plan to not go back to doing what you were doing before. And so that guy took those words, hung on to those words, spent five years in prison, got out, made a plan, and became the chef. Now, he saw Steve speaking, and he ran around to, to talk to Steve. And Steve Security's like, no, 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 stand down. And this and his guy was like, listen, man, I got I to gotta holler at this guy. I got to talk to him today. I got to let him know my story. Because of what he said, it changed my life, right? So I want to be that relevant person or teacher or educator. I want to be able to say something that might turn someone around or get them thinking in a different direction, right? Because sometimes people think like, oh, I can't really see myself doing that or, oh, woe is me. They might have that attitude, right? I want them to know that they're not alone, right? That they're able to, to come through whatever storm that, that God has given you. Um, and, I, and I don't mean to be, like, religious, but I feel like everybody has a, a purpose here on, on, on this earth. And so my purpose is hopefully to guide those folks to where it is whatever their passion is and whatever it is that they want to do in their life. And hopefully I can steer them to that. You know what I mean? How much of an impact did your father have on your life and why your, your career and journey? My father had a huge impact on my career and life. Um, one thing that my parents always stressed was education and sports, student athlete, and that's what I was. I, I played football, I played basketball, I ran track. One thing I did notice though, and I said this to my dad one day, my mom was a respiratory therapist at New England Baptist Hospital for 30 years. And my dad was a lawyer at the end. He, you know, he was a teacher and he was a lawyer and he did a lot of other things. But I always used to say, you know, when I would look around at my teammates and notice they didn't have any parents there at any of the games or the meets or whatever it is. And I said one day to my dad, I said, you're at every one of my basketball games. You're at every one of my, my meets. You're at every one of my football games. How do you guys do that? And he said to me, Tony, if it's important to you, it's important to us. Right? And I went, wow. Right? What a gift to give a kid. Right? You're there at every game. So I tried to do that with my kids. Right? Be there at every sporting event. Be there whenever they needed me. Right? Because you just never know when's the last time you're going to see them. Right? So you want to take every day and use every day to your advantage. And that's what I tried to do. How do you navigate the balance between personal values and the convenience of modern living? Yeah, that's tough. That's a tough question, Jackson. Because, uh, you know, today's modern living is all about social media and we're on our phones, right? And uh, you go out to dinner and you see a family of four or five and they're all on their phones instead of talking to each other, right? So that's, that's kind of tough. Um, today's a lot different today. Um, in terms of communication. And I'll give you an example. My youngest son is 18, and all he's known is social media and apps, Snapchat, and all that stuff, right? And Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, and he's, that's all he's known. My oldest daughter, Caitlin, she's 38. 
So think about her 20 years earlier when she was his age. Social media wasn't as big. It wasn't that big of a thing. But now it is. It's integrated into our, our society. And it's a good thing and a bad thing, I think. It's good that we have it because we can communicate around the world and get clients and talk to people we never would normally talk to in our life. But it's a bad thing because sometimes it can lead to cyberbullying. It can lead to like people putting things on Facebook about someone else that is not good. I mean, it, it's, it's a double-edged sword, kind of like AI. <laughs> and that's another story. It's dangerous you know? and positive. Yes, it's good and bad. You know what I mean? There's always a yin and a yang with everything. And I feel like for that, it's definitely that, for sure. What do you think? What kind of legacy do you hope to leave behind? Um, that's a good one. That's a, that's a good question um, because legacy means you're leaving something for someone to carry on. Um, and I'm hoping that the core values that my parents instilled in me, that I was able to pass those along to my, my children. Uh, and I want to also do that for my students. Uh, I want them to, to see the value in everything, not just some things that they like, but everything. Yeah. Experience everything. Um, make sure that you make an informed decision, right? Don't just go along with what, some, what somebody says, right? Get the facts, kind of figure it out, make an informed decision about it. Um, and I think that would be a, a lasting legacy of, of just acceptance. Uh, if you think about it, right, Martin Luther King had it best, where he said, we're nonviolent and, you know, we're going to tear those walls down. And I often think to myself, what would Martin Luther King think today about the state of our society? What, what would he think? And I think about it a lot because in some retrospects, we're still fighting that same fight today in certain aspects. Um, now, have we come a long way? Absolutely. Right? But remember, the rear view mirror, we're not looking in the back. It's everything's in front of us. It's what can we do now, today, to impact those around us that absolutely can, like, understand that we're here to help them get over whatever it is they need to get over, right? And I think that's important. Um, being, being able to do that is really, really important. Uh, I want to thank everybody um, for uh, tuning in to us today. Um, Jackson was gracious in asking me all these questions, which I really loved. Um, I just want you guys to know that uh, please tune in next time, episode number two, um, and uh, for our episode of Footprints. That's what we call this. Um, and please subscribe to our YouTube channel, and you can catch us, ladies and gentlemen, on SoundCloud, or you can even watch us on the uh, educational channel which I believe is, is uh, channel 22. Um, that's what I have to say. And hopefully you enjoyed this particular program. Uh, we'll do this every week. And uh, see you next time. Thank you, Jackson. Appreciate you, brother. Give me one. <laughs>